In 2019, Spain was the second most visited country in the world. An incredible 83.7 million tourists entered the country, looking to soak up its vibrant culture, take in its beautiful sights, and relax on one of its many picturesque beaches. There is certainly some peace of mind as a tourist in Spain. Its crime rates are fairly low in comparison to other European countries, often making it feel like a safe environment. Like every country though, Spain has its dark side. In today's episode, we will be exploring that very side as we shed light on three chilling mysteries from Spain. Manuela Bugefa and Virginia Espejo. On April 23rd, 1992, 14 year old Virginia Espejo asked her mother for money, which she intended on using to buy a birthday cake for a party she was attending later that afternoon. However, Virginia never attended the birthday celebration that she'd told her mother about. Instead, she met up with one of her closest friends, 13 year old Manuela Bugefa and the pair took the train to Reynosa, about 18 miles from their hometown. They had plans to visit a nightclub and had made sure to hide this fact from their parents. They'd invited a third friend to join them, but she'd declined, opting to stay at home instead. At around 9 p.m., Virginia and Moella left the club and began to make their way home. Investigators believe that the two girls had decided to hitchhike back after discovering that no return trains were running at that time of night. They were last seen by a witness who was in fact a resident of their hometown and who was unable to offer them a ride as her car was full. She told investigators that she saw the two girls enter a white vehicle described as a Seat 127 with a Valladolid license plate near the town's main street. Manuela and Virginia were never seen again, but there were no indications that the pair planned to run away. They had very little money on them and only wore the clothing on their backs. Nothing was missing from their bedrooms. As the hours passed and the girls failed to come home, their families went to the civil guard, but were met with an element of resistance from the agents. Back in 1992, the protocols for missing children were not the same as they are today. The families of Manuela and Virginia were told they'd need to wait 48 hours before a search could be launched. This would later cause the civil guard to receive criticism and backlash, as it's understood that the first 24 hours after an individual goes missing are the most vital. Virginia's sister recalled being told by an agent, they have gone to a party, they will come back whenever they want. During the early 1990s, a Spanish journalist named Paco Lobarton presented the public service program Who Knows Where, which is similar to the BBC's Crime Watch program in the UK. Viewers could phone into the show with tips and information about unsolved cases, with Who Knows Where focusing specifically on missing person cases. The show aired an episode about Manuela and Virginia, and it received dozens of calls as a result. Alleged sightings placed the girls all over Spain, while other callers appeared to be unwell, cruel hoaxers who said they would bring harm to the girls and that their parents would never see them alive again. Family members traveled as far as Asturias to see if they could track down their missing loved ones, but instead were met with young girls who bore a resemblance to the pair. No trace of the real Manuela and Virginia was ever found. In October of 1994, a group of friends walking near the Rey K. Hadar Reservoir, about 25 miles from where the girls were last seen, found two skulls. Two members of the group were writers for a newspaper that published their findings without analysis or forewarning the families, claiming the skulls could possibly belong to the two missing girls. The lead, after all that, turned out to be a dead end. The skulls did not belong to Manuela and Virginia, they were too old, believed to date back to the 1930s. Three years later, in 1997, 
a witness claimed that the girls were in Madrid with what he described as a punk community. He alleged that Manuela had cut her hair short and dyed it blue with one small white section. Investigators put together composite images of the girls and how they may have looked in 1997, but when they finally located the women the witness had described, it was discovered they were not, in fact, Manuela and Virginia. In 2001, two more skulls were discovered, but they were determined to belong to victims of the Civil War. Furthermore, in 2018, a human jawbone was found in a reservoir in Cantabria, but it did not belong to the missing girls. Then in 2021, new hope came for the families of Manuela and Virginia, when a woman called into a TV program about unsolved cases to tell them that one year before the girls went missing, she and one of her friends had suffered an attempted kidnapping. After alerting the TV show, the woman gave a statement to the civil guard, which led to a new line of inquiry being investigated. The woman and her friend had struggled with the driver, causing him to veer off the side of the road. She and her friend then took the opportunity to flee. The details of the case were chillingly similar to that of Manuela and Virginia. The two women had been hitchhiking and had been picked up by someone in a white Seat 127. More hopeful still, the witness was able to identify the man driving the vehicle and he became a suspect in the case. He had a criminal record, which included being arrested four times for attempted sexual assault. Another suspect came to light around this time, but law enforcement never recovered a photograph of him from 1992. He is described as having been a young man in 1992, between the ages of 20 and 25. Investigators noted that he'd temporarily left the country in August of that year. This suspect reportedly gave conflicting accounts to law enforcement, as he initially denied knowing the girls, but then stated in a later interview with the civil guard that he had been introduced to them at the club by a friend. He then added that he'd never seen the girls again after the brief introductions were made. Over the years, several allegations have been made that the remains of Manuela and Virginia are in the Fontoria mine, an anonymous individual tipped the police off very early on in the investigation, and while their bodies weren't recovered at the time, it has been noted that a thick layer of mud prevented law enforcement from seeing the bottom. Additionally, the nearby Servetus Cave hasn't been searched either, though in 1993, the Civil Guard reported that it would be an ideal location to hide bodies. In 2021, the case was reopened by the Civil Guard, but still, Manuela and Virginia and their families are yet to receive justice. Man of Somiedo. On January 11th, 2015, a group of hikers walking by the AS-227 road, less than a mile from the town of Puerto de Somiedo, discovered the dead body of a man in the nearby undergrowth. Investigators arrived promptly on the scene and found the body wrapped inside a blanket, missing one leg and with no clothing. Upon first glance, there was some indication that he had been taken care of during his final years. His hair had been combed, his beard had been trimmed, and he was clean with clear skin. This made it confusing to investigators when they noticed his missing leg. Initially, they suspected that John Doe's end had been a violent one. However, it was later determined during the post-mortem that the man's leg had likely gone missing as a result of scavenging animals. The blanket he was found with was analyzed, and it was deemed to have been made in the 1950s, carried by only two stores in the entire country. Receipt records hadn't been kept, however, meaning the authorities were unable to trace the purchaser. John Doe is described as being incredibly short at just four foot five. He had a beard and was likely between the ages of 45 and 60. His body appeared dangerously thin, with one investigator noting that it resembled one of the bodies from the Holocaust. He weighed just 77 pounds. His limbs and fingers were described as being disproportionately long, while his head was unusually small. He also suffered from pectus carinatum, or pigeon chest, a deformity where overgrowth of the cartilage between the ribs and sternum causes the chest to stick out unusually. Furthermore, John Doe's upper back was hunched. There was briefly some speculation that the man suffered from Marfan syndrome, 
a genetic disorder resulting in an abnormally curved spine, incredibly flexible joints, and long arms, legs, fingers, and toes. Sufferers are often tall and thin, and complications with the heart and aorta can arise from the condition. However, as John Doe was exceptionally short in height, they began to theorize that his growth had been halted by chronic malnutrition. The autopsy showed that John Doe's nutrition had been satisfactory. He was not malnourished, as had been originally theorized. It was also concretely determined through DNA testing that he didn't have Marfan, but suffered from cocaine syndrome, a rare genetic disorder often featuring growth disorders, intellectual deficits, neuromotor difficulties, and impaired vision and hearing. Children with this condition generally look older than they are, and often don't make it to age 12. There are several variants of cocaine syndrome. Some adults live to their 20s or even 30s, while others with a milder, slower version of the condition can live to their 40s and 50s. John Doe's odd appearance now made sense, with his strange features lining up with the diagnosis. His cause of death was established as a heart attack, this wasn't uncommon in those with the condition, as it can affect the heart and the aorta. The rarity of John Doe's condition led investigators to believe that it wouldn't take them long to close the case, but they were wrong. They visited Puerto de Somiedo, the nearest town to where the body was found, but found no clues to his identity. Searching further afield yielded no answers either, not even at hospitals and housing facilities. Next, detectives looked into birth records and spoke with gynecologists and midwives who may have helped deliver the baby, but this turned up no new leads. They then attempted to look for women who may have worked as unlicensed rural midwives around his estimated time of birth, but found nothing. Another dead end came when they reached out to construction companies looking for builders who may have created a basement space or a false wall to another room inside a home. Law enforcement began to put together some theories in the absence of answers. They suspected John Doe was from somewhere much further than Somiedo, or that he had been hidden by his family, possibly due to shame or a fear of judgment, and that nobody knew of his existence because he had been locked away for most of his life, being cared for but unacknowledged by those outside the family. As he was likely born between 1955 and 1970, there was also some speculation that he had been born to a single mother. Spain's government was still deeply religious at the time, and an unwed mother would have been met with disapproval and difficulties. If John Doan's mother had been unwed at the time of his birth, she likely hid her pregnancy from everyone and delivered the baby alone or with someone she trusted. To avoid conflict or community backlash, she likely kept the child hidden. Investigators theorized that John Doe had been left somewhere he could easily be found. Had he been left further down the slope, his body likely would have become covered in snow and never been recovered. Authorities believe that whoever had cared for John Doe wanted him to have a proper burial. He was buried with a blank headstone at a local cemetery. While his DNA has been entered into several databases, some of which are international, the real identity of the man of Somiedo remains a mystery. Malen Rodriguez In Mallorca on December 2nd, 2013, 15-year-old Malin Rodriguez awoke at 6 a.m. and proceeded to carry out her normal morning routine. She got dressed, had breakfast, and left for school. When the day was over, she hopped onto a bus to get home before realizing that she had left her keys in the house. Since her father was at work and her brother was out, she got off the bus and called her boyfriend, 17-year-old Daniel, asking if she could come and have lunch with him. His parents gave the pair the okay, and she left a message on her father's voicemail, letting him know where she was. Following this, Malin began the journey to Daniel's on her skateboard. She was around two and a half miles from his home, and many witnesses placed her on the cycle path that day. CCTV showed her at 3.51 p.m. skating towards the village of Sonfera. 300 meters ahead of her, at a petrol station, was another CCTV camera still on Marlon's route. But the 15-year-old never passed it. She vanished in the section of the cycle path between the two cameras. When Marlin didn't show up to Daniel's house, he and his parents became concerned. Soon, a missing persons report was filed. 
Like the case of Manuela and Virginia, though, investigators seemed to shrug off the concerns of the 15-year-old's loved ones. They believed she was a runaway teenager and refused to begin looking for her until 48 hours had passed. When they finally began to investigate, they found that her mobile phone had run out of battery, so they were unable to trace her this way. An examination of the CCTV from the petrol station, which Malin should have passed but failed to do so, further revealed that the teenager's younger brother had been cycling nearby. In fact, the two should have passed one another as they were riding in the opposite direction, but they never did. Her brother, Bruno, never saw her. Over the next few weeks, authorities combed through wooded areas in search of Marlin, using mountain rescue specialists, agents from the Civil Guard, local police, and firefighters. Nearby coastal cliffs were checked, and divers took to the lakes at a neighboring golf course. No sign of the 15-year-old was discovered. Law enforcement theories about what became of Marlin seemed to split into two camps. The camp that thinks she ran away from home, and the camp that believes she met with foul play. By all accounts, Marlin had previously lived a very troubled life. Originally from Argentina, she, her brother, and her parents relocated to Mallorca when Marlin was five. She was described as outgoing and independent, and was a keen rock music enthusiast who hoped to go to art school, and dreamed of one day opening her own tattoo studio. However, her family life was heavily troubled. When her parents divorced in 2006, just three years after the move to Spain, Marlin and Bruno began living with their father. Marlin's relationship with her mother was said to be difficult, but she was no better off with her father, who was sometimes physically abusive. At some point, Marlin began experimenting with drugs. When she was just 13, her father, Alfonso, discovered her undressed in bed with a boy, and she was horrifically beaten by him to the point that she had to be hospitalized. Several years later, though, she stopped using drugs and began to take care of herself, eventually meeting Daniel, an aspiring musician whom she began dating. Daniel told investigators that in the days before her disappearance, Marlin had been frequently seen crying and had made an appointment with the school counselor the following day. Her friends backed up these statements. This led to some speculation that she was so troubled, she decided to leave everything behind. Investigators who believed she met with foul play, however, drew this conclusion from information which indicated that her father was in business with people who were part of organized crime. The son of a drug trafficker he knew offered 3,500 euros in exchange for the whereabouts of Marlin, but this failed to produce any leads. There are some allegations online that the man who offered the reward began to distance himself from Alfonso afterwards. Her mother, Natalia, was on a trip to Thailand at the time of her daughter's disappearance. In the years since, she has repeatedly voiced her disappointment and frustration with the civil guard for being unable to find any answers in the case. She noted that while her daughter was stubborn, she was also mature. She believes that Marlin was taken by somebody she knew. In the decades since Marlin went missing, no trace of her has ever been found. At the time of her disappearance, 15-year-old Marlin Rodriguez wore red trainers, ripped jeans, and a plaid shirt with a t-shirt underneath. She also wore a denim jacket. When she went missing, she weighed 121 pounds and stood at 5 foot 3. She is described as having long, curly brown hair and brown eyes. If you have any information about Marlin's disappearance, you can call the local missing persons group on plus 34 642 Six five zero seven seven five, And there you have the facts. Please leave a comment down below with your own theories and speculations, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching. Stay alert, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.